context, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce the director of the Stanford Center on Longevity, uh, Laura Karstensen. Uh, Laura is the founding director of the center and uh, is the Farley Dickinson Junior Professor of Public Policy and Professor of Psychology. Uh, her work has uh, been supported by the National Institute of Aging for over 20 years, and in 2005, she was honored with a Merit Award from the National Institute of Health. Uh, with her students and colleagues, she has published more than 100 articles on lifespan development, uh, and I'm very happy to, to uh, introduce her. Laura? Thank you, Ken. Uh, and Katie and Stephen, it's so fun to work with you on this project. It's one of the most exciting things we do here, I think, at the Center. Thank you all for, for being here uh, and sharing your time with us this evening. It is great to see you here and to begin to help think together about these challenges and these issues. What, what I thought I would do is to kind of zoom out and sort of put into historical perspective uh, the era in which we're living today. Um, and what I'll argue is that this era we're living in demands science and technology arguably more than any other time in human history. We need you. <laughs> um, let me get right to the bottom line. <laughs> the 20th century made us a fabulous gift with essentially no strings attached. An extra 30 years for the average person. And that's what we need to begin talking about now. We need to begin to think about supersized lives and how we build a culture that supports them. Now, most of you in this room can expect to certainly make it into your 80s, into your 90s, and lots of you here are gonna live beyond 100. And your children and your grandchildren? <laughs> well, a distinguished demographer and Germany recently predicted that the majority of children born since the year 2000, the majority, will live to be 100 and beyond. This is a game changer for every aspect of life as we know it. My grandchildren went to nursery school here at Bing Nursery School on Stanford campus, and occasionally I would pick them up when they got out of school and you know, I think about longevity all the time. <laughs> you know, when I'm driving my car and trying to fall asleep at night and so on. So I drive to this nursery school and all I had to do was just, just squint my eyes just the tiny bit. And when I looked at the playground and these little ones climbing on the play structures and swinging on the tire swings, what I saw were the first centenarians of the 22nd century. They're here. <laughs> They're living among us, and it is our job, in fact, I believe it's our duty, <laughs> to build a world that ensures that the majority of them are going to reach 100 and beyond, physically fit, mentally sharp, and financially secure. That's what we need to do, and that really is the mission of the Stanford Center on Longevity. Um, now, these added years of life are an amazing cultural accomplishment. Just an amazing, stunning advance and you know, what, what we have done. But you know, when you think about it and you listen to people talk about aging and you watch them respond to aging, most people are not sort of jumping and yelling how great, you know, <laughs> we're going to be really, really, really old. Um, and you know, the policymakers, they are very concerned that we're going to run out of money. Uh, that these programs that were developed premise on re premised on relatively small percentage of the population being old are going to go bust. And the actuaries, well, the actuaries, they are terrified <laughs> because they just see these numbers going up and up and up with no sign, really, of stopping. Now, I maintain that the reason that people are so negative about aging and so worried is because it's brand new. I mean, old age is brand new, that is. Um, uh, we increase life expectancy dramatically and culture hasn't caught up. Now you've heard Katie say this and Ken say this, culture hasn't caught up. What do we mean by this? Well, culture 
And the way that we think about this is the crucible that holds science and technology and the built environment and broad social practices and, and behavioral norms. All of that is part of culture. And humans are exquisitely sensitive to culture. The culture guides us through life and it ensures whether we will flourish or whether we will fail. And our culture today, the one that is guiding us through life and supporting us or failing to support us, is a culture that evolved around lives half as long as the ones that we're living today. So here's, here's, here's what happened. Here's the situation. More years were added to average life expectancy in the 20th century than all years added to life expectancy across all prior millennia of human evolution combined. In a blink of an eye and historical terms, we nearly double the length of the lives that we're living. Throughout most of human evolution, life was really short. <laughs> we don't know for sure what it was on the plains of the Africa savanna, but the estimates are from 18 to 20. I mean, life expectancy on average was short. And in those early years, evolution did indeed act on the aging process. And life got a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer at a snail-like pace acting in the way that evolution does. And then by the 1800s, life expectancy has inched up to the mid-30s. By 1900, life expectancy in this country was 47. And at the end of that century, 77. Today it's 78, nearly 79. And as I say, the actuaries, <laughs> this trend continues to go up. Three, mo three months have been being added to life expectancy at 65 in recent years every year. So every, every year <laughs> we get, or every four years we're getting an added year of life. This is an amazing shift and change. And across these very same years that life expectancy was going up so dramatically, fertility rates fell by half. So we could have just had longer lives and we wouldn't have seen aging societies, but instead we have half as many babies and people are living twice as long and that reshapes the distribution of age in the population. So the percentage of aging, of aged people, I should say, in societies is changing, um, changing dramatically. In the United States, in 1900, 4% of the population was over 65. Today, it's 13%. And it will go to 20% by 2030. Now, we're the young kid on the block internationally. In Japan, already 20% of the population is over 65, and it's supposed to go to 28% by 2030. Game changers. These will change every aspect of life as we know it. Now, Mind you, we have not, and I repeat, have not found the fountain of youth. Uh, it's not that we haven't looked. <laughs> uh, humans started looking for the fountain of youth ever since we understood our own mortality. We used to sail off in ships, and now we turn to laboratories. And as you all know, we now have Calico. So Google's on it. Anything could happen. <laughs> we could increase lifespan, the capacity of people to live for a particular amount of time. But lifespan is not what changed in the 20th century. It was life expectancy. We do know, so, so one is a theoretical concept, lifespan, how long, what's the potential? The other is simply an arithmetic mean, how long does a group live? And it's life expectancy uh, that changed. We do know that lifespan could be 120 and beyond. And the reason we know is because the oldest woman ever to have lived died in 1997 at the age of 122. Jean-Louis Calma, French woman, who died um, after living a very interesting, full, and really kind of marvelous life. And any of you who are uneasy about aging should hear and read about Jean-Louis Calma. She, there are lots of Calma stories that float around in my world. Uh, she made a rap album when she was 110. She played herself in the movie Vincent and Me making her the oldest actress ever to have been at the age of 114. She was the only person on the planet who'd actually known Vincent van Gogh, and that was a movie, <laughs> so, so she was in it. <laughs> um, there was a journalist who interviewed her when she was 120, 
and ask the question, what sort of a future do you envision? And Kalma paused and said, a very short one. <laughs> but my favorite story about Kalma, hands down, is about a property deal that she made at the ripe old age of 90. Uh, she lived in the French city of Arles. She lived in her own home, and she had every intention of living out her life in this home. As I say, she was very fit and very sharp. Um, and, and was doing well. Uh, but there was this young lawyer, he was 47 years old, and he loved this house and he wanted to buy it. So he made her an offer to buy the home. She said no. And he would go away and he'd come back with a better offer and this went on and on. And one day he arrives on her doorstep and he says, I've got a proposition for you. He says, I will pay you $400 a month for the rest of your life if you will deed the property to me on your death. So she thinks about it. <laughs> she says, okay. And a contract is drawn up and over the next 30 years, <laughs> he pays her more than three times the value of her home. She outlived him by two years. <laughs> he died at 77. <laughs> But they had become friends, and he had attended her birthday party, 120th, shortly before he died. And um, <laughs> they were overheard talking, and she had turned to him at one point, and she said, you know, we all make bad deals. <laughs> so that's what 120 can look like. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the story of how we as a society somehow launched ourselves into this era of very long life really doesn't begin with a discussion about older people at all. It begins with a story about babies. In 1900 in this country, 25% of babies died before they reached five. Many more died before they reached 12. And death was common at all ages. Maternal mortality was very, very high. Very few families escape the death of one of its close members at some point uh, during their lives. Life expectancy thus went up largely because fewer of the youngsters died. It was those kinds of changes in the 20th century that increased this average. And what has essentially happened is that this population pyramid, you remember population pyramids we learned about in school with many at the bottom winnowed to a tiny peak at the top, which represented the population in the United States and in every single country around the planet in 1950. <laughs> Those population pyramids are being reshaped into rectangles. <laughs> and what this means is that for the first time, the vast majority of babies are having the opportunity to grow old. And if you're the kind of person who can get chills from biostatistics, <laughs> these are the ones that should do it. I mean, this reshaping, this unprecedented change that's allowing old age to become a typical stage in life, a normative stage in life, is a gift that was handed to us from our ancestors. Um, how did it happen? Well, here we get down to what's going on tonight. The short answer to that question is science and technology. Science and technology brought about those kinds of changes that allowed us to live far longer than any of those ancestors uh, ever, ever could have imagined. You know, I'm really amused when I hear, and I often do, and I know you do too, I hear young people say how much more technologically proficient they are than their uh, grandparents and great-grandparents. Our grandparents and great-grandparents <laughs> were so technologically proficient, they doubled the length of life. Top that. <laughs> Top that. These changes came about because of something that Nobel laureate Bob Fogel and his colleague Dora Costa called technophysioevolution. Evolution not by biological or natural selection, but evolution through technological advances. In the 20th century, agricultural technologies became so effective that for the first time in history, we had a steady food supply throughout the year. Never before had that occurred. Electricity was discovered and then harnessed and became widely available in every American household. And with electricity comes refrigeration 
and imagine the safety of the food supply and how it improves when refrigeration is available in virtually every American home. Pasteurization of food, purification of the waterways contributed dramatically to a reduction in the spread and perpetuation of disease. The systematic disposal of waste represented a dramatic increase in a reduction of contagious disease. And there are historians who write that we have our garbage collectors, technologists, to thank as much as our physicians for this increase in life expectancy. We are no genetically different to our knowledge than our ancestors were 10,000 years ago. But because of technology, our vital organs have greatly improved. Um, average body size increased by 50%. It's now getting a little out of hand. <laughs> but malnutrition was the problem throughout most of history. We are taller today by a couple inches than our ancestors were 150 years ago. And our brains process information faster. All of this is changing because of science and technology. And of course, we came to live a lot longer. So here we are, standing at a point in history uh, when four, five, and conceivably six generations may be alive at the same time. To put this in perspective, today a 20-year-old has a greater chance of having a living grandmother than a 20-year-old had of having a living mother 100 years ago. Families have changed irrevocably. And so, you know, you would think, since science and technology are the reasons for this advance, that science and technology would be all over this, trying to find ways that we could use science and technology to ensure uh, happiness, health, and prosperity as we live far longer lives. Um, and it's particularly curious that technology community has kind of decided to sort of sit it out until recently, until Aging 2.0 and some other really interesting developments. And you know, I think a lot of this is because people sort of give up on aging. You know, that there's this deep-seated belief that there's nothing you can do about it. That as we grow older, we're gonna just do more poorly on every aspect of life. And that's been the kind of belief. And if that's your belief, there's, there's just not a lot of inspiration to go in and change it. If that's your belief and your work in technology, then the kinds of technologies you develop are ones that come in at end stage. They're technologies that help the most frail, the sickest people, not technologies necessarily that are gonna transform the way that we age. In fact, if you Google technology and aging, almost every site that comes up is about healthcare. You gotta go, so old people, the only thing we're gonna do is provide healthcare? Now, I do, do not misunderstand me. We need to provide better healthcare and we need better healthcare technologies, but that's not all of what life is about past 65. In fact, the vast majority of people 65 years old are living independently in their own homes, on their own, and making contributions to families and communities. What does that population want and need from technology? Now, there are some very thoughtful interesting, imaginative new products on the market, uh, lively and aging 2.0 uh, uh, um, uh, group that has been supported by them uh, are coming on the market with sensor-based systems that are really beautiful, low-touch te technologies that connect families through activity sharing so that people know when one another is safe. And then, of course, we have elegant, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing technologies that help people who have very severe disabilities, uh, like the uh, serving set um, that was developed by Sha Yao and won last year's design challenge. So there are some really beautiful, innovative technologies. But we need to do more. We need a lot more. And when I think about the technology space and aging, I think the biggest hole may be the technologies that we need to develop that will help young people grow old well. And that's a, that, that's a hole that continues to exist. Um, for the first time in history, most young people living in the developed world um, are gonna live longer than they ever thought they would. Uh, almost all of them are gonna not only reach old age, they're gonna be old for decades. And we need to find ways that we can help 
that process. We need technologies that help people transform and transport themselves into the future. The human brain did not evolve to plan 20, 30 years into the future. Nothing in our evolutionary heritage helped us to do that. Technologies, uh, virtual reality, some of that being done by Jeremy Valenson here at Stanford can help in aiding people with that. Um, we need technologies that can monitor people's spending habits and help them make good decisions. We need technologies that will help keep people physically fit. And that's why we're here tonight. Um, I recently was teaching uh, a class at Stanford and I asked this large group of Stanford students, um, how many of you look forward to being 80? And one hand went up. <laughs> and then I said, what if I told you that you could be fit and sharp and financially secure at 80? And more than half of the hands go up. People are sort of interested in this. But there were a couple students sitting down in the front and they were sort of talking to each other and giggling and I looked over at them and I said, and how about if I could add good looking? And I had every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we need to start aiming higher and change the culture of human aging. And I want to thank all of you for being partners in that tonight. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think, again, this is something Aging 2.0 is doing, involving older people in technology development. You know, again, I think it's really hard when you're 20 to think about your people who are 80. You know, it's like Martians. You know, sort of, you know, ooh, you know, I see them. <laughs> they move. I think I'll do this. You know, but they sort of think, well, maybe we can help them use Twitter better. And you know, older people are actually not as interested in having expansive new social networks as they are in focusing on a few very select people they care and know very well. And so some of it is just from being, becoming familiar. You know, one, one of the problems we've had, I think, with prior ages is that, and I mean eras, is that we've got incredible age segregation which made sense if life expectancy is gonna be 47. Then you gotta get your education early, get a job, reproduce, have a family, whatever, retire, and you're, you're dead. <laughs> when you have life expectancies of 90 and 100, that's not a good model. Uh, so we, one of the things we could do is to begin to have leisure before retirement, <laughs> have young people in the workplace in high school, in college, taking breaks, figuring out what they want to do. So we could reduce age segregation, and then I think we'll get more of that contact. But for now, I really do think a good idea is to have older people think about what it is they need. Um, I'm interested to hear a little more about the uh, relationship between what you're doing and the transhumanist community, which focuses a lot on sort of human augmentation through technology, but at all stages of life. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there could be a lot of synergies, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if, if that conversation has started or not. Well, Ken would know more about it if it's starting in the center. It's certainly something we're interested in. 
you know, it makes me think of the exoskeletons and so on and that kind of uh, uh, technology that could be developed. Um, or an iPhone, you know, <laughs> you know all of this. Uh, so our, we, we have great interest in all technologies that could improve quality of life. So, thanks. thanks. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Carson.